It's good to see you guys. Hi. All right, I'm ready. And you know how I know that I'm ready? Cue fanny pack. I gotta tell you, I've got some awesome stuff in this thing. In fact, you can't start with bad breath. Give me just a second here. Curiously strong. All right. Have you ever seen students run for the door? Not because they're excited, not because they're hyper, but running for the door to get out of your classroom. <laughs> I have, and it's a moment that changed my life as a teacher. So imagine if you would, a fairly nondescript brick junior senior high school with a US highway running in front of it, an elementary school to one side, and surrounding the other two sides, cornfields. It's a small school, like graduating class of 60 small, right? Like we have a drive your tractor to school day small, okay? Are you starting to get the picture? And if you come into the Spanish classroom, you'll see a tallish, handsome, follically challenged yet optimistic teacher Leading the lesson of the day. Okay, I'm not gonna play the coy third person game with you. It was me. <laughs> and so, leading the lesson of the day. And then he forgets his next line. <laughs> and there's all these people staring at him, and this is his worst nightmare, and it's happened right now. <laughs> Follically challenged yet optimistic teacher leading the lesson of the day. And, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. And in that moment, okay, so I'm, I'm teaching my Spanish 2 class. Okay, I got it now, I got it. Yes. I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but there's a lot of you and the lights are really bright, so. And in his Spanish 2 classroom, he was leading a, I was leading a riveting lecture on reflexive verbs. I mean, it was inspirational, you know? And as soon as I wrapped up that lecture, as soon as I was done, I very graciously gave my students five minutes to work on their homework. Now this may surprise you, but my students weren't all that interested in working on my homework. You know? Yeah, I know. They, um, yeah, they, were, they weren't that interested in working on my homework. Some of them were, some of them had their heads down. Some of them were thinking about the ball game that night. Some of them were chatting, not so quietly. And in that moment, I felt like I had lost total control of that class. Part of the reason I felt that way was because I had lost total control of that class. <laughs> and I started to have some emotions rising up in me, and one of those was anger. I mean, I had asked them, you know, I had told them to work on that assignment, and they weren't doing it. And so I walked to the front of the classroom, and with as much sass as a balding 20-something white guy can muster, I was like, oh, so you're not working on your homework, huh? That must mean you got it all done and I didn't give you enough. I guess I need to give you some more. Yeah, I know. And if they didn't despise me before, then they totally despised me then. And so what did they do? They grumbled, they got out their assignment, and they fake worked on it for two minutes until the bell rang. You know, what any red-blooded American teenager would do in a moment like that. The bell rang, and those students sprinted for the door. I'd never seen students sprint for the door before, but there they were, pushing, bumping into tables. It was all over in a matter of seconds. 
And there I stood in that empty, quiet classroom, all by myself. And I started to think, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what they signed up for. This isn't what teaching is supposed to be like. And in that moment, something changed inside of me. Has that ever happened to you before? A watershed moment in your life where something powerful happens, but you don't see the effects of it until later? Okay, so fast forward one year. I'm standing in the same classroom. I'm teaching the same way. But the difference is that I was unsettled about it. So I was standing at the podium going through review questions at the end of the chapter with my students out of the textbook. And I looked up at my students. And they were all different students, but I saw the same, the exact same stuff. I saw the same slumped posture, the same disconnect, and the same look on their faces. I don't want to be here. I couldn't do it anymore. And all of a sudden, I heard myself say, everybody, grab your textbooks. Has that ever happened to you before? You hear yourself say something, and you go, who just said that? Was that, was that really me? Did I really just say that? And so my students perked up a little bit, and they watched me walk to the back of the classroom, to my seven-foot-tall wooden cabinets. I opened them up, and I said, your textbooks go in here. And so they started walking by to put their textbooks up, giving me the side eye as if to say, are we in trouble? But the truth was that I was in trouble because I had let my textbooks become a crutch that I would lean on when I was unsure of myself, or I was uncomfortable, or if I just didn't have enough time. I knew that if I didn't sever ties with my textbooks, if I didn't sever ties with my textbooks, I would stay in that exact same rut, and I would miss out on the impact that I could have on those kids' lives. And I think a lot of us have had a moment like that where the traditional way of teaching just wasn't getting the job done for us, and we were ready for change. If you've had an unsettled moment like that, say yes. yes. All right. You know, it's easy to do what's been done to us before, to continue on with business as usual. I mean, it's the path of least resistance. But there's a problem with business as usual. See. We're in this weird place in the history of education where the traditional ways of teaching that we've been relying on for decades just aren't doing the job. They're not getting the results that we want. In fact, new research and brain science are showing that they may not have been all that effective in the first place. But we've also got this technology age that we just can't count on yet. You know, we're in the infancy of the digital revolution, and we're still trying to figure out how to navigate life with smartphones and the internet and Netflix binges and The Bachelor. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how that one fits in society. I don't know. The world just doesn't look the same or function the same or reward us the same way as it used to. Because you see, knowledge was the currency of the 20, 20th century, but ideas are the currency of the 21st century. We have information at our fingertips and at the tip of our tongues. And our success, but even more specifically, our students' success, won't depend on what they know as much as what they can do with it and how they can use it to solve problems. And it, do, it doesn't make sense. You know, when, how do, how do we make sense of this? When the old age doesn't totally work anymore and we can't count on the new age yet? Well, here's something that I've, that I've figured out. 
is that there's no playbook for learning in today's age. We're going to have to figure it out. And thankfully, we're smart people, and we're in this together. So what happened after I locked my textbooks up? Well, immediately, I started to feel this sense of freedom. <laughs> I finally gave myself permission to do these lessons and activities and learning experiences that I've been holding out on for so long. It's strange because I could have given myself that permission a long time ago without ditching my textbooks, but for some reason, that's what it took. And instead of using my textbooks, I started creating study guides that would make clear what the textbook was leaving unclear. My students and I started making vocabulary lists based on their own curiosity and interest, where the textbook gave us nonsensical lists of words that they would never use. We started creating video projects where the textbook offered nothing multimedia. We were making infographics and interactive posters with the vocabulary and the grammar that we had been learning, where the textbook gave us these dry, sanitized activities. And we started having conversations. I mean, imagine that, learning a language by talking to people, you know? Instead of the forced conversation prompts that we got from the textbook. I started teaching like a pirate. Don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. There was one lesson in particular where I ditched a boring vocabulary lesson about art. And my students left the classroom and we headed down to the art hallway. You know the art hallway where the art class is and all the student art is displayed? Only it wasn't the art hallway that day. It was a swanky art gallery. And my students were at the fancy gallery exhibition opening. We had hors d'oeuvres, Dixie cups of fruit punch. It's amazing what motivation Dixie cups and fruit punch will do for kids, right? Yeah. And we were practicing our Spanish, talking about art. We were learning and we were having fun. I started adding video calls into my class. My students got connected with a class in Valencia, Spain, and we did these weekly Skype calls together. And I did it because I wanted them to improve their language skills. But what I didn't realize is that it would change their worldview. Because they met these kids and they saw that they were on the other side of the world, but they were interested in the same stuff you know, shoes and sports and food. They laughed at the same jokes. They started to see that these kids were so far away and their language was different and the color of their skin was different, but they were all people. They were more alike, as Maya Angelou said, than they were unalike. Have you had experiences like this before? You know, think back to things that you've tried, the changes that you made in your own classroom when you started to get unsettled with business as usual. Now, there's a common thread that runs through all of these experiences, an essential ingredient that connects all of these ideas. And without it, we're at a disadvantage as the world changes around us. But when we use it, we're nimble and agile, and we're able to roll with the punches that the 21st century throws at us. And that essential ingredient is this. We have to be willing to take risks. Because if we're not willing to take risks, we can't help our students to be who they really, really need to be. You know, taking a risk is scary. A lot of times it's not at the top of our to-do list. Whenever somebody asks you, what are you doing today? People's gut instinct usually isn't to say, oh, I was thinking about taking some risks. Yeah, risk taking. Coffee first, but then risk taking. Taking risks makes us feel vulnerable. And we are hardwired as teachers 
to avoid exposing vulnerability. I mean, teachers of the past had all of the answers. The content was in their heads, and it was their job to distribute that content. And if they didn't know the answers, then they weren't doing their jobs. You know, taking risks can be scary, and it can make us feel vulnerable, but that's what our students really need, our teachers that are willing to do that, to take risks. And teachers that are willing to take risks are the kind of teachers that I call maverick teachers. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, those maverick teachers. And of course, if we're gonna talk about maverick teachers, there's one thing that I gotta mention. Am I right? You knew your mind was going there anyway. Here, hang on a second. Kind of loses its effect if you have to take your glasses off first. It's all good, though. It's all good. No, but we need those maverick teachers, you know? The ones who are willing to buck the status quo and experiment in their classroom. They're the black sheep and the purple cows. They're the ones who don't assign a lesson. They design a lesson based on their students and their strengths and their favorite music, and their apps, and their favorite YouTubers. And they, they create lessons with no assurance that it's gonna go over smoothly. They take a risk with the willingness that it may crash and burn, but if they do, a lot of times their students just thank them for doing something different, you know? That's what a maverick teacher is. And so what does it actually look like to be a maverick teacher, to take risks in the classroom. It's easy to talk about in generalities, you know? But when you're doing it, day to day, class to class, week to week, what is maverick teaching? What does risk taking in the classroom actually look like? I think it looks kind of like this. Brainstorm, create, succeed just a little, become impatient, improve on strengths, improve on weaknesses, find your imperfection, sloppiness, and chaos, accept them, embrace them, welcome feedback, feel hurt by feedback, learn from it and improve, succeed just a little more. Feel satisfaction, feel complacence. Push complacence away because it doesn't help kids. Observe, harvest and curate curiosity. Laugh, ha uh, hear questions. Stop class to explore answers. Try to solve problems. Fail at solving said problems. Forget that you accepted your imperfection, sloppiness, and chaos earlier. Remind yourself that you accepted them and accept them again. Try new skills. Expose inadequacies. Model how to deal with inadequacies. Identify shortcomings. Cry. Throw things. Shake your head. Don't give up. Accept your fallibility. Move forward anyway. Pursue progress recklessly. Repeat. And repeat again. And repeat again. Retire. And then continue on with loved ones and friends as if they were your students. <laughs> now, why do we take risks in the classroom anyway? Why do we do this maverick teaching in the first place? 
Why do we do it? You know why? Because we want to be that teacher. You know, the teacher that kids remember. The teacher that made class fun, made the content interesting. The teacher that showed them that they loved learning. No, on second thought, we don't want to be that teacher. We do it because we want kids to have had that teacher. And they've become a better person because of it. And our community is richer because of it. And the world is a better place because of it. That's why we do Maverick teaching. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? You know why I did it a lot of times? Parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> the parents would come in, they'd sit down, and we'd talk about Spanish class. They'd look at, look at each other with a smirk, and they'd say, oh, I took three years of Spanish in high school, and I can't speak a word of it. <laughs> I'd laugh and smile on the outside, but inside, I was at a slow boil. And I would think, that is not what school is supposed to be like, and that is not what Spanish class is going to be like for your kid. Why do we do it? Because school is amazing. Schools are the epicenter of the community. Have you ever seen the emotion that floods back on adults when they come back in the building? Have you ever been to a beloved teacher's funeral? People, we are hardwired for learning, and there is an inherent joy in learning. But some kids hate school. They look at you with that look, I don't want to be here. They sprint for the door when the bell rings. But when you use that magic key to unlock that secret door to inspiration, to ignite a student's burning passion, to see that light bulb come on that we've all, we've all talked about before, that's why we do it. That's where it is. That's where school is amazing. And when you help kids to do that, then you are amazing. That's why we do Maverick teaching. Why do we do it? Because for heaven's sake, you deserve to take a risk. I mean, teachers are leaving the profession in droves. We are under attack by the government and by the media. We are asked to instruct, supervise, personalize, and individualize, yet standardize, maintain fidelity, and leave no child behind. And we don't even need a magic wand to do it but we definitely deserve a cape and a superhero name for it. For goodness sake, you deserve to take some risks and to come to school energized and to try something that will inspire you and help you to lift up the students that you love so dearly. You deserve it. You. Why do we take these risks? Why do we do it? Why do we do this Maverick teaching? That's why we do it. So glad I've got this thing. <laughs> Love the fanny pack. All right. So let's go back into my classroom. I'm trying to be the Maverick teacher. I'm creating lessons based on who my students are and what they need. And on that day, I thought I had solved a problem. But the truth was, that I had uncovered lots of new problems. My life wasn't easier, it was more complicated. Creating lessons all the time was hard work, and it would have been so much easier to let the photocopier do it for me. I was also dealing with a lot of serious self-doubt. It's an issue that I still deal with to this day. You can't imagine the amount of negative self-talk that I was going through while I was doing this, and even goes through me now. You know, I would think, who are you to redesign a class? You're not an expert. You don't have any experience. If this sounds like you, say yes. Yeah. You know, we can be a wrecking ball 
to our, our own plans and dreams. We can, we're our own worst enemy, you know? Even up on this stage right now, I'm in this silent battle with myself. You know, like, who are you to come up here on this stage and to talk in front of all of these people? You know they're gonna think that you're a fraud and a phony if you do. I've had lots of fears, and fear can be a huge motivating factor. Thankfully, I was afraid of my kids running for the door again more than anything. You know, that was, that was my biggest motivation. And so I've tried lots of stuff. And I had plenty of, I've had, I, had, I had lots of things succeed, but I had my fair share of failure too. In fact, I've had plenty of big mushroom cloud size blow-ups in my classroom before. Let me give you a couple examples. So right after I got computers in my class, I was all excited about all of the apps and the digital tools and the websites that I could use. But part of the problem is that I didn't always check them out ahead of time as well as I should have. <laughs> Story of our lives, right? I came across this one tool. Let's call it ABC Designer, not its real name. An ABC designer was going to let us create infographics and cool graphic design right there on our computers. And I was enamored with that idea. Now, ABC designer has since rebranded. They've made tons of improvements. It's a much better product. But at that point, it was glitchy and clunky and slow. My students were using it. And for the first half of class, most of them got a text box and a couple of images onto the screen. And that was it. I had one class that seriously started using the term ABC designer as a synonym for failure. <laughs> hey, Mr. Miller, we could use ABC designer to do that. <laughs> and the class would be like, no. Another one didn't have anything to do with technology. See, I had learned about this conversational way of teaching Spanish. And I wanted to, I wanted to try it. So I went to this three-day seminar to learn how to ask, uh, how to tell stories in Spanish and ask students questions about it. So I came back and I was all ready to go. Whenever I would ask students a question, I would use the word clase, you know, Spanish for class, before the question and before most of my other sentences. Honestly, I was using the word clase all the time, all the time. And I didn't realize how bad it was till I went to graduation. And one of my students used part of his valedictorian speech <laughs> to tell the audience that they had counted the number of times that I used class A in class. <laughs> 42. Thanks for that. Yeah. See, if I'd wanted to avoid all of those blow up moments, I could have totally avoided taking risks completely in my classroom. But maverick teaching isn't about executing the perfect lesson. It's about sparking students' curiosity and interest. And when you do that, you run the risk of having failure. Curiosity and interest are an elusive thing in the classroom, aren't they? And sometimes when we try to grasp them and we think that we've failed, Students sometimes still get something out of that lesson that we never, ever expected. And sometimes, again, they just thank us for being willing to do something different, you know? But not all of my lessons were totally blowing up. And finally, some of them were starting to pay off. And the first place that I saw some of that payoff was at the door to my classroom. Now they say that one of the most effective ways to start class is to greet your students at the door. And so to be a good Spanish teacher, I greeted my students at the door in Spanish. I'd ask them simple things like, buenos dias or como estas. I don't know if you've ever tried to talk to English speaking kids in Spanish before, but when you do, it kind of makes them nervous and they avoid eye contact with you. <laughs> They slip in the door, sit down at their desk, and they hide behind their hand. They're like, I hope he doesn't talk to me in Spanish again. 
But as I kept taking risks and kept trying new lessons, those interactions changed. And there was more and more variety in their responses. Some of them would say, muy bien, or fantástico. Until at some point, a student came up to me and said, estoy un poco resfriado, pero bastante bien. I looked at her and I was like, who are you? You look like Sydney, but you sound like a Hispano hablante. You know something else that I ditched? Homework. <laughs> Homework is such a tradition in schools. But if you look at all of the time that kids do it, and the time that we take grading it, for me, I've just never gotten the results that I had hoped for out of it. Research can't prove it as a best practice, but we keep doing it anyway. And when you look at all of the fights at home and the equity issues that it brings up and the cheating, I've started to think that I'm not convinced that kids are better having done it. Now, if you've had your own doubts about why we're still assigning homework, say yes. See, you're not alone. You're not the only one. Hang on a second. I missed a spot this morning. Does that look good, Danny? OK, thanks. I had to ask a fellow ball guy. And you, you, you get it. You get it. Here, do you need to borrow this? Yeah? OK, here you go. All right, don't cut yourself. You know, something else I was doing in the classroom was succeeding, and I didn't even know why until later. So what I was doing was students were, when we would do a story in Spanish, I would have students retell it in their own words. And it turns out that that's a very brain-friendly practice that's proven by cognitive science. It's this thing called retrieval. And it says that studying and learning are more effective when you retrieve them out of your brain than if you push information back into it. Because how do we ask students to study? What do we ask them to do? Go home and go back over your notes, reread the material, right? What direction is the information flowing? Back in. But research shows that if you do a brain dump, where you have students retell what they've learned in their own words, there are huge long-term memory benefits involved in that. I really believe in the power of this cognitive science stuff, but I don't think the effects of it have totally trickled down into the classroom. Another one that's been really, really successful is this thing called spaced repetition. And it tells us that studying in short bursts isn't enough and that our brain needs to forget new information or get rusty at a new skill, then be able to pick it back up and do it again for us to retain it long term. There's a reason that spiraling has hung around so long in schools. It's because it works. Now, there's one place where you can totally see the effects of retrieval and spaced repetition at work in our everyday lives. And that one place is music. Think about it. You're driving down the road, listening to the radio, and a song comes on every other day, or every day, or with some radio stations every hour. That's spaced repetition. And when you try to sing along with the lyrics, whether you know the lyrics or not, that's retrieval. And so to prove to you the power of retrieval and spaced repetition, we're going to do a little experiment. So I'm going to play a song that I am convinced that 99% of you know. And as you hear this song play, I want you to sing along with the lyrics. Yes, I'm really asking you to do this. Now, when the song stops and the chorus hits, because of retrieval and spaced repetition, we are going to sing the chorus by heart all together. You ready for this? Here we go. 
didn't know we were going to do karaoke tonight, did you? Right? I'm all full of surprises. So there you go. Retrieval and space repetition. They work. Now, if you're looking for more practical ideas you can use in the classroom, I've got something for you. There is a free ebook I've got called 101 Practical Ways to Ditch That Textbook. Because I'm always looking for ways to use technology, creativity, and innovation in the classroom. And this has got tons of things that you can start using in class right away. It's got screenshots that shows you how it's supposed to look. It's got links to articles that explain what you need to do. And so there's that free ebook and another free ebook that I've got available for you. And if you're looking at that stuff and you're going, hmm, that's some really great stuff. How can I get Matt's stuff? <laughs> That's a real thing, I promise. If you go to getmattstuff.com and enter your email address, it's going to send those ebooks right into your inbox. The stakes are huge. The world needs us to get this right, right now. I don't know if you've realized it, but we're in a world right now that is begging for leaders, creative problem solvers, and ethical decision makers who are going to usher us into the future that we envision. So what risks are you willing to take so that your students don't sprint for the door? To what lengths are you willing to go to prepare them for this changing world? What's your why? And is your why bigger than your desire to stay comfortable? Comfortable. Or to be safe. You know about safe teaching, right? Have you ever gone into safe teaching zone? You know, safe teaching is where we go where we're unsure of ourselves or we just don't want to rock the boat. And for me, safe teaching has always been direct instruction and assigning worksheets. You know, it's where I could go, where I felt comfortable, where I felt safe. And if I felt like I was starting to push it too far, I could always pull back there. You know something about safe teaching mode? About safe teaching? Safe teaching is actually risky teaching. So think about it, that direct instruction that I was doing. So if I start on a lecture, it is easy, super easy for students to flip that attention switch to off in less than a minute. I mean, they can be giving you eye contact, nodding, smiling, thinking about prom dresses or sneakers or the cute boy or girl across the room, you know? And you look at that and you go, how much learning actually happens when kids are disconnected from my very well-prepared, very well-delivered instruction? Or what about worksheets? You know, worksheets can become, to kids, worksheets can be a hurdle to cross instead of an actual learning opportunity. And it makes you ask again, how much learning actually comes out of that? You know, playing it safe can be risky. But kids don't need us to play it safe. They need us to be those maverick teachers. They are begging us to prepare them for this world. They need us to model what it looks like to take risks, 
so that they're able to do that and so that they're ready to adapt to whatever comes at them in the future. So it's up to you now, Maverick. Call the ball. Because not only do our students need you, but all of us need you. Thank you. Thank you.